Good morning. My name is Shayla Holub, and I'm a faculty member in the School of Behavioral and Brain Sciences at UT Dallas and a faculty affiliate for the Center for Children and Families. It is my pleasure to welcome you all to this second talk in our spring lecture series. We appreciate you being here to learn more about how we can have important conversations with children about racial injustice. I hope you feel free to use the Q&A box if you have questions for Dr. Brody during today's talk. We will do our best to save some time for questions at the end. And now, it is my privilege to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Selena Brody. Dr. Brody is currently a professor of instruction and assistant dean for equity, justice, and inclusion in the School of Behavioral and Brain Sciences here at UT Dallas. She is also an assistant director for the UTD Center for Teaching and Learning. Dr. Brody received her BA in psychology with a concentration in faith, peace, and justice studies from Boston College and her master's and PhD from the University of Santa Cruz, where she studied intergroup relations with some of the most prominent names in the field. Dr. Brody has published papers and given presentations around the country on promoting positive social relations between groups and most recently, recently written book chapters about how to effectively teach about diversity and promote social justice in the classroom. Dr. Brody has received numerous awards related to teaching and service, including Women Leading in Diversity Award, College Outstanding Professor of the Year, and the Innovative Teaching Award from the Society for the Psychological Study of Social Issues. Last but not least, Dr. Brody is an amazing mentor to many in our community. Her dedication to promoting social change through her work in the community her scholarship, and her support of students is unmatched. She has helped many of us to navigate our grief about current social woes without despair, but with hope that we can change the future. I know you will learn something important today about how to have conversations that create change. Um, so I want to welcome Dr. Brody um, so we can hear about her talk, Conversations That Create Change, Talking to Kids About Injustice. Thank you so much, Dr. Holub, and thank you to the Center for Children and Families for the invitation to speak today, uh, to Rachel for all the behind the scenes organizing and Dr. Margaret Owen as well for her work in organizing the series. I'm gonna go ahead and share my slides. Okay, hopefully you can see my slides. The title of my talk is Conversations That Create Change. And my career has been filled with these kinds of conversations. And I've been very fortunate in this regard. A little bit about me. I'm trained as a social psychologist and my interest and expertise is specifically about intergroup contact and prejudice reduction. So more specifically, the conditions under which groups from different social identities can interact with each other and lead to some really positive outcomes like prejudice reduction. Most of my work has been with college students, specifically teaching the psychology of prejudice, um, but I've also been able to do some community work. You know, social science research has the power to inform and solve really pressing problems. And so there's opportunities to connect the work we do into our communities. And so I've done some anti-racism work and other kind of creative prejudice reduction initiatives in schools, in the justice system, and other anti-racist trainings. And I really was excited about this talk because it gave me an opportunity to explore a corner of intergroup relations literature that focus, focuses specifically on children and interactions children have with adults. I am a parent myself, and I just want to acknowledge that these conversations and decisions are hard to make. And I'm hoping that you'll leave this talk um, with some specific tips on, on how to navigate these difficult discussions. And just another plug for uh, a book for any of you who are student facing or child facing and trying to navigate these moments. Um, this book, the contributions of, of my colleagues who do this kind of work, I have found to be very helpful in guiding the way that we approach these kinds of conversations. So in this talk, um, the goal is to help us all understand how children make sense of inequality and to give them the language, the skills, and the tools to be able to engage and thrive in really diverse environments where they're going to find themselves. So I'm going to be covering four main areas. 
The first is children's awareness of race as they develop. We'll do a quick literature review of what children are capable of. I'll go over some research on parent-child conversations about race within the home, and also looking at what's happening in other places where children find themselves in schools. And we'll end with some real world interventions aimed at reducing bias. And two important announcements to make. I want to start with a land acknowledgement uh, that I, I acknowledge that we, UT Dallas, are on sacred traditional land of the indigenous people of the Caddo Nation. And also, because we are discussing sensitive material today that's quite personal to people, I want to acknowledge that the content in this presentation reflects uh, my own professional expertise and does not necessarily reflect any official policy or position of the University of Texas at Dallas. So why should we expend energy on this conversation? Well, I think that there's a really good return on investment here. Uh, what we know is that children who learn the skills to talk about race and ethnic heritage constructively show some really positive intergroup outcomes. Um, so the skill building that we see uh, when we invest in children in this way um, results in some great things. Uh, children tend to develop empathy for others, learn new perspectives, understand their own identity better, and show less racial bias. Uh, so I think it's kind of worth our while to, to learn how to do this better. And because I'm a teacher, uh, I always like to start with a little assessment. And so if you do have a little scrap of paper near you, um, I want you to try your best guess at some of these questions about what children are capable of. So there'll be just four of them. The first question, at what age do you think that humans first prefer faces from particular racial groups? And you can be as specific as possible. So like years, comma, months. The second question, at what age do you think that humans can categorize faces based on race? The third question, at what age do humans first start associating perceived low status racial groups with negative traits? And the fourth question, at what age do you think humans first start associating particular racial groups with status, like social status, wealth, or power? All right, so we'll return to these. So let's think about what children are doing. Um, babies, if you are lucky enough to attend the last CCF talk with Dr. Megan Swanson, you learned a lot about babies. And we saw those pictures of the beautiful baby brains and the incredible development from zero to two years old. And we're seeing that here as well when we're thinking about what kind of development is happening with children and race. So it turns out um, that this is happening really, really early. Three-month-old infants notice differences. There's evidence for three-month-old babies actually showing a visual preference for own race faces compared to other race faces. By nine months, they're like really skilled at this. They are really good at categorizing own race versus other race. And so, you know, babies are doing what babies are supposed to be doing. They're taking stock of their environments and they're sorting their worlds, right? So they're sorting their physical world, but they're also sorting their social world. And so they're um, at this point um, noticing differences and, you know, sort of categorizing them. But there's a big difference between noticing and devaluing difference, right? So at this point, there's a lot of uh, sort of putting things in different categories, but as children continue to develop, um, we start to notice that racial consciousness and some of this devaluing starts to emerge. And so by three years old, U.S. children are perceiving some racial groups as having lower status and pairing them with negative traits. By four, children seem to be reflecting an adult understanding of racial status and associating whiteness with high status markers like wealth. And by five, this is kindergarten age, children notice that racial groups are treated differently and that there is a social hierarchy. And it is at this point that some children have already internalized group status. And so this is how they are perceiving their worlds. 
And I would argue that this is, of course, bad for children who have internalized low status, but this is also problematic for children who have internalized high status. And so at this point, it might be useful to look at research and researchers who have spent some time looking at how children actually talk about race on their own during this time of early childhood. So I'm going to show you um, some research that's done by Deborah Van Osdale and Joe Fagan, and they conducted a year-long in-depth study at a multiracial preschool. And so what they did, so imagine spending a time, uh, a year, looking at how children are spontaneously talking about race. They transcribed story after story about young children making references to race during play. And what was really interesting is that their race talk often reflected dynamics that adults might be really surprised to see in children who are so young. So I'm going to share with you one of the transcriptions from these researchers. And so the story here is that uh, they were observing three girls who were playing with a wagon. The wagon gets stuck and one of the children gets out to help pull. So this is an exchange with uh, two four-year-old white children and one three-year-old Asian American child. And so Renee, who is a white child and four years old, has her hands on her hips and she frowns at Ling Mai, who is an Asian American three-year-old child. Renee says, no, no, you can't pull this wagon. Only white Americans can pull this wagon. Ling Mai tries again to lift the handle of the wagon. Renee again insists that only white Americans are permitted to do this task. So let's like think about this interaction for a second. Where did Renee get this racist idea, right? This is a racist idea that only some groups have privileges, in this case, pulling a wagon. The old way of thinking about this, I think, is that Renee must have gotten this idea at home, right? That somebody explicitly taught Renee this kind of, of thinking. And I think what we're going to realize here in today's talk is that it's not always explicit uh, conversations like this that Renee are going to get, you know, Renee's going to get this idea about um, status and privilege and power. And so when we consider when we consider where Renee is understanding something like this, we might look to Dr. Beverly Tatum, who is an expert on the psychology of racism and author of Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria? And also a book called Can We Talk About Race? Dr. Tatum talks about racism being smog in the air and it's all around us. And for children, um, like Renee. Renee might be picking up on messages in her own world, right, uh, that maybe she doesn't fully understand. So she's reflecting some adult language when she's talking to Ling Mai, but she might not fully understand the implications of her speech. And so what we know is that the conversations we are having with children are as important as the conversations we aren't having. Children are making assumptions that reflect their observations of the world. And it's really important to recognize that failure to discuss racial issues does in fact communicate race-related values and perspectives to children. And so when we look at who's having conversations and when they are having them, um, this data shows um, the age group you know, uh, of children and the percentage of parents that report that they discuss race sometimes or, or often. So you see that um, you know, parents of three to five year olds, only about 30% are actually having conversations regularly. Six to nine year olds, about 40%, also 10 to 12 year olds, 40%. And we can actually slice and dice this a little bit more. And when we look at who's having conversations, um, Black, Asian, and Hispanic parents are more likely than white parents to have these conversations. So, you know, 61% of black parents versus 26% of white parents, right? 
So it seems like a lot of parents aren't talking to their kids about race. What are some of the consequences of this? We can look to some experimental work that looks at the effect of diverse content in parent-child discussions. And so this study was looking at a lot of different things. I'm gonna focus specifically on something that really struck me. And so in this study, they're looking at the effect of children watching content that was specifically designed for prejudice reduction and looking at then parents and children talking about this content. So I wanna show you one little piece of, of the data here. And this is the response to the question. These are all white children who were um, in this study and they were asked, do your parents like black people? And the lighter gray bars sort of on the left indicate the children's responses. This is the pretest, right? So lighter gray bars, the pretest. And you could see that 56% said yes in the pretest, my parents like black people. But look how many children don't know. 40% of children say they don't know the answer to this question. These children aren't sure. After some discussion, and I will say that the researchers even um, disclosed that the parents didn't even do a great job at discussion. So this is just like some discussion. We see the, the needle move a little bit, right? Children become less unsure about their parents' attitudes uh, about Black people. And, you know, if we think about this for a second, we might say maybe children just don't even know what their parents think about any race, right? That might be fair. They they don't know, and you know they're really they're really kind of young here. Um, these are children who are ages five to seven in this study, and it turns out they they kind of do know. <laughs> they know how their how their parents feel about white people, and so ninety four percent of children said that their white parents liked white people. So they do have a sense of some of their parents' attitudes. Uh, they just aren't sure about others. And so we might think, okay, um, that's maybe not what the parents intended, right? So the parents in the study um, perhaps actually believe that they have very positive attitudes. So why don't their children understand this? It seems that absent explicit discussion about racial attitudes, you know, children are unsure or they come to their own conclusion about their parents' values and attitudes. So one way to remedy this is to have some explicit discussions about your, your attitudes. What we see though, is that parents are actually delaying conversations about race. So we just saw um, you know, those are those are children who are five to seven years old, and we know a little bit about what five year olds are already concluding about the world. And so parents at that point should be having more conversations with their children about race, but they're not. We saw that lots of parents are not having regular conversations. And the reason that parents give for this is that they believe that children aren't quite yet capable of processing this information. And so parents say that they want to have conversations when it's developmentally appropriate. And that's fair, right? So they're trying to do the right thing. But what it turns out is that parents are as much as four and a half years off developmental averages. And what's really interesting is that they're only off when it comes to their perceptions of race processing. They're actually pretty good at predicting developmental averages for other types of processing. So let's review what we know so far. Children are savvier and more capable at race processing than many parents think. This causes parents to delay important conversations for what they think is appropriate age Many parents aren't having conversations about race regularly. When we look at who is, black parents are over twice as likely to have conversations regularly than white parents. 
But it's also important to note, we don't know what those conversations are about. So there may be entirely different conversations happening in these homes. I want to share with you what a former student of mine had to say in class just a few years ago. We'll call her Joy. Joy said, as an African-American woman with five brothers, my parents had to pull us to the side and give us the talk. The talk is how we are to behave when we are pulled over by a police officer. I always wonder, did other races have this talk with their kids? Let's pause and think about what this means for Joy, for her parents, for her brothers. She's asking a really important question. And we're gonna look to research to help us answer Joy's question. We can look at the ways in which black parents engage in race talk with their children. Parents of color more generally practice what's called race conscious parenting. Race conscious parenting is when we value the culture, the traditions, the achievements, and the history of a group of people. We know that black parents explicitly talk to their children about interactions with police and with racial violence. And what Joy called the talk is what researchers also call the talk. And the talk includes things like where to keep your hands, your tone and manner of speech, and your posture when engaging with law enforcement or other authorities. Parents of color report that they see race conversations as a protective practice for living in a world that devalues those who are not white. And so this would resonate with Joy and Joy's family, right? That this was very much what Joy was reporting was happening in her own house. If we contrast this to what white parents are doing in the home, research indicates that white American parents tend to prefer a colorblind approach and or avoid race specific talk with their kids almost entirely. And when we say a colorblind approach, um, really what this means, it's an ideology about diversity in that ignoring group differences is the way to achieve group harmony. And so instead of focusing on the differences between groups, you focus instead on universal human experiences. And so the thinking is a little bit, um, if people don't see differences between groups, then there won't be discrimination, prejudice, or stereotyping of others. So it's often coming from a good place, but not necessarily grounded in how human beings really operate, you know, according to social psychological research. So I want to share some examples of how white parents might approach talking about um, racial injustice. And so in this study, they looked at 40 white middle class families. Most of these children were between three and 10 years old. And it was done during the time of um, uh, Ferguson. And what we know is that most of the white middle class parents did not talk to their kids about racism. Even when the news was saturated with stories of police brutality and racial tension. And when asked why, the parents reflected that they wanted to protect their children and to allow their children to keep a worry-free childhood. So I wanna give you some specific, specific examples from this study. So in these interviews, we heard things like this. So a parent of young children said, I prefer to keep my child in a little bubble. A parent of a four and a seven-year-old said, my sons get very scared of things. I'm still trying to shelter them both. I don't want them to have bad dreams. I want to keep them kids as long as I can. The only thing they should worry about is going outside and playing. A parent of preteens, 
didn't want kids to worry about things they don't have to worry about. A parent of four didn't speak to her children about racial protests in Ferguson because she did not like to foster the negative. She and seven other parents pursued a no news policy in their household and cars. So if we think about these kinds of responses, I would argue that the theme of protection comes into play here too, but it's in a very different context. This protection is about protecting childhood and innocence, not about protecting literal life, right? The existence of their children. And so to return back to Joy's question, Joy wondered about whether other parents were having these kinds of conversations. Penelope, a white mother of three white sons, explains, I think there's a lot of anger there that I couldn't even begin to understand. When I think about the conversations Black parents have to have with their sons, you know, this is how you need to believe with the police. I know I will never have to do that. So I don't know how I would ad address Ferguson. There's an acknowledgement here from Penelope that her sons will be treated differently. And you can see that colorblind ideology crack a little bit, right? There's an acknowledgement that families like Joy's have a different experience inside the home. But there's also an acknowledgement of, I also don't know how to do this. I don't know how to navigate this conversation. It seems really hard. So when we think about this section, what do we know so far? Black parents are about twice as likely to have these regular conversations and the content of the conversations are quite different. White parents tend to not have the same conversations as black parents. So let's shift to think about other places where children spend their time and they may encounter some race information. This would be in schools. So when we look at what's happening in the classroom, we might look to teachers. So here we know that the teachers often receive training, but they don't always know whether they are supported in having race focused curriculum or conversations. And so most teachers report that they're not sure whether their school's leadership is encouraging, discouraging them to have these conversations related to different social identities. And so for these teachers, you know, if you're if you're a teacher, you you know, you're not getting a clear message like about whether you should have these conversations or not, you might consider the cost benefit ratio here and whether you really do have institutional support to have this kind of conversation in the classroom. And so when we look at what happens when teachers might start to have these conversations or even when institutions like school districts try to have these conversations, there's sometimes pushback to having race focused curriculum. You may have followed this story. This is, um, you know, sort of local to us in the DFW community. Um, South Lakes Carroll ISD has been in the news. They had a district diversity council that formed after some kind of troubling videos of students chanting racial slurs went viral in 2018 and 2019. And these were really harmful videos to, um, to the community. And so this district diversity council was made up of, you know, 60 individuals um, with different roles in, in the district. And the council suggested a number of action items to make the district more inclusive, including cultural competency training and an audit of district curriculum through an equity lens. And so they were trying to make the school district more inclusive for students of color, particularly black students. What happened next was that these, plan, these plans sparked protests. 
with some parents calling the the diversity council, the diversity police. And the plans actually had to pause after a, a parent in the district filed a lawsuit. And so if you are seeing this on the news and you are a teacher, what kind of uh, takeaway might you have? You might think that maybe not everybody wants this kind of conversation in, in the classroom. You may leave it to textbooks to present any race content, right? So you have the sort of safety of it being in the curriculum and you're gonna teach what's in, in the textbook. So it's useful then to consider what's in our textbooks. When we look at race-focused curriculum in textbooks, this is um, a pretty recent study that focuses specifically on Texas. So it's it's relevant to many of us who, um, who are here in Texas right now. This is a content analysis of textbooks using natural language processing, which is like AI. And it's looking at how gender, race, and ethnicity is covered in Texas US history textbooks. The researchers at Stanford University took the 15 top US history textbooks that are used in Texas public schools. And through their analysis, found a couple of things. That in these textbooks, the most common historical figures are white men. Latinx people are rarely mentioned. Language about black people tends to be associated with low agency, low power words. Women are discussed in the context of domestic activities. And more conservative counties tend to adopt textbooks with lower representation of women and black people. And it's important in a state like Texas to, to think about why this might matter for the rest of the country also, given that we have the second largest student population in the United States. The textbooks that we choose in Texas actually have significant influence on US textbook content. And so when we're thinking about representation and whether that representation is of a fuller history of what people of color have contributed to the United States, we might see that the types of messages that are being communicated in the, the textbooks um, are, are not as representative as they could be. And so this gives us an opportunity to think of of what kinds of messages students are getting, both at home, but also in schools. So I'll shift to, to talk a little bit about interventions and recommendations now. And so what we know is that parents delay the kinds of race conversations that we hope that they will make because they underestimate children's capabilities. And so the million dollar question here is, what if we increase adults' scientific literacy? Will that actually increase their willingness to talk to their children about race? And the great news here is yes, it does. And so here are the answers to the questions that you were asked before. And uh, you can give yourself a grade. I give you all an A plus uh, for participating. Um, but you can see that that when we teach parents what sort of the developmental averages are, they can better calibrate to their own individual children. What is uh, the right time to have these kinds of conversations? So increasing parental scientific literacy, check, right? That's going to help us. We can also employ race conscious parenting. So we learned what black parents and uh, other uh, parents of color do at home. They tend to talk more about race. And we can all learn some lessons there about how to have continuous intervention. So we don't want our first conversation. So think back to Penelope, right? The white mother of three white sons who didn't know how to talk about Ferguson. 
Well, that probably shouldn't be the first time we are having a race conversation. The idea is to do this continuously, right? So from the time that children are young and noticing race, this is an opportunity. And so let's say there's a, you know, a toddler, like I love toddlers, they're, they're the best. And a toddler is, you know, just, they're, they're, they're simple sentences and they're noticing the world and toddlers monologue a lot, right? They're just like narrating uh, their, their social, social worlds. And so let's say that I'm at Target and there's a little toddler there with another family and the toddler sees me, points to me and says, that lady is brown. What do you think a lot of parents would do in that situation? I think a lot of parents would maybe be embarrassed and say, shh, we don't say that. That's not polite. And maybe even apologize to me for this loud observation. I would suggest with race conscious parenting to look at this as an amazing opportunity to talk to your child about difference. And so the child said a fact, I am brown. And the parent might, instead of shushing the child at that point, say, maybe so I could hear it as well. Yes, that lady has beautiful brown skin. She also has black curly hair. Do you know anyone? Can we think of anyone else we know who has beautiful brown skin and curly black hair? I just gave myself beautiful skin. <laughs> so when the child hears that, the noticing of difference is normalized and the difference is not devalued. So then maybe the child says, yes, Auntie Joelle has brown skin and black curly hair. And the parent might say, Yes, you're right. And so this is an opportunity to start young, right? When this child is two, two and a half, three years old and noticing the world to normalize noticing those differences um, instead of shushing them. Another thing to do is to realize that the lack of messaging that white children receive is a message. And so white racial socialization is something that, um, that white parents might consider looking into to examine what it means to be white and to have white identity and to talk about that as well. So race conversations are not just for people of color, they are for everyone. There should also be an acknowledgement that identities shape people's experiences and that racism and other forms of injustice are real. So when, when parents have a colorblind ideology, it's often coming from a good place in that, you know, they want to say all people are equal. Um, and, and that's a lovely, a lovely way to think about things, but we wanna make sure we also add on uh, that not all people's experiences are equal, right? That people have different experiences of, of going through the world and that these forms of injustice are real. And to also remember that not all race talk is racism talk, that we should acknowledge the full humanity and range of experiences uh, that people have with their social identities, right? Um, and so to not just focus on stories of, of pain and oppression and, and trauma, but to also focus on joy and celebration, contributions and achievements, right? To, to show the full humanity of the people who we are talking about. When it comes to what's happening in schools, um, I would suggest getting involved in your school districts and your state's discussions on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Your school district um, might have a, a committee that's designed with parents and community members and students and teachers to reflect on the ways in which uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion are, are handled, right? And so what we want to do is to make sure um, that as parents, we know what's happening in school. So ask questions, ask questions about representation in textbooks, ask questions about how decisions about textbooks are made. 
And I would also say that those conversations are often like you're playing the long game, right? You're you're trying to understand and, and make change over the long haul. So in the short term, what you might do is think about supplementing curriculum at home if you are able. So that means, you know, thinking about what kinds of, of books are in your uh, library that you're checking out, what kind of content that you are engaging in. As a parent myself, uh, that's something that that I've taken um, taken to heart, right? So being really mindful of the kinds of, of books and information that um, I'm, I'm bringing home and engaging with with my child. And I'm an intergroup contact person, and I, I feel like it's really important to acknowledge that intergroup contact is still our best hope for prejudice reduction. And so we saw that children, absent any information from their parents, sometimes make some conclusions about their parents' attitudes. And we saw that children are often unsure um, white children are often unsure about their white parents' attitudes or racial attitudes. And so this gives us an opportunity to reflect on the diversity of our own friend groups and of your children's friend groups. Um, uh, some of the research indicates that parents say that they have they have cross group friends, um, but what we see is that those friends don't often come home. They're they're not they're not necessarily seen by children. And so they might be work friends, uh, you know, or, or people that adults see in their adult life and not necessarily um, something that the, the child sees. And so that's something to think about. Is your child exposed to uh, diverse uh, children as well, whether in their school or their neighborhood? This also shapes their observations of the world. And of course, the media that we consume is powerful too. Uh, television, books, and current events offer opportunities for discussion. And so while some of the parents that we saw interviewed um, had a no news policy because they didn't want negativity to, um, to be part of you know, childhood, um, I would encourage current events as, excuse me, a springboard for discussion. And so we know that children are going to make assumptions and observations about the world. Don't we wanna be a part of helping them make sense of what's happening in the world? Children have a pretty great sense of justice. If you've ever heard a child say, that's not fair, <laughs> they get it. They get things that aren't fair. And so being able to explain things in the world and what a gift it is for them to have your perspective on explaining things in a way that they can understand. And remember, children are savvier than we think in their ability to process this information. So I do have references that I will share with you after the talk, um, but I want to take an opportunity to, um, to really thank many people who contributed to this talk. At UTD, we have really special and remarkable students, and um, I love them so much. And I want to specifically uh, thank some members of the Psychology of Prejudice class um, from a year ago, who, when we started working on this talk, helped research some of the content that I presented today. And they called themselves the Social Justice League, and they're like a group of superheroes. And I've listed their names here. Um, and they worked really hard to, um, to try to answer these important questions. And we really enjoyed going on this journey together. Would like to thank the Inclusion, Diversity, Equity, and Anti-Racism, that spells IDEA, group, um, and really all of the UTD colleagues and friends and scholars who are committed to having hard conversations and producing meaningful change. I think anyone who does this work knows that it's hard and sometimes uncomfortable to engage in race talk or any conversations about injustice. And I just admire and respect my colleagues so much for the work that they do. I also want to acknowledge the Society for the Psychological Study of Social Issues. Um, these are a lot of psychologists who are committed to connecting their research 
to solving the world's most pressing issues. And uh, they do a lot of work to connect, um, you know, research that may be in the lab or the field to real interventions in com communities and also with legislation. And um, I just, I know when I first joined over, you know, 20 years ago and learned about this kind of work and the really um, important role that SPICI has played in U.S. civil rights history. I was very, very moved by uh, this kind of work and it's inspired me as well. And of course, thank you to all of you who have spent your hour with me and, um, and anyone committed to creating an anti-racist world. Thank you so much for your time. And so I think we have a good amount of time for questions. I'm going to stop sharing and um, Dr. Holub, do we have any questions? We do, and thank you, Dr. Brody, for a wonderful talk. Um, we have um, a question here about, um, um, so the question is, who is responsible to educate parents on when it is developmentally appropriate to address uh, children about race? Preschools, parent groups, any other suggestions? That, that is a fantastic question. I mean, as a parent myself, I was kind of expecting a handbook, a training handbook, right? Um, after I had my child and it just, it never came. Um, we often are sort of writing the rules as we, we go along. And so, um, you know, in, in a perfect world, right? We would have, we would have this kind of information, um, you know, you know, sort of, we would learn it before we ever had children, right? Uh, and uh, I, I think that there are a number of touch points, right? So the more places that we can get this information, the better, if you ask me. So, um, you know, community groups, preschool. So I, I know that, um, you know, the, the preschool that my daughter attended, they had parent education nights, and, and I found those to be really helpful to understand the stage that that my child was at, uh, you know, so whether that was two years old or three years old or four years old and so forth, that would be a perfect place to do it. But um, not everybody has access to preschool, right? And this is another sort of equity challenge. Um, so, you know, I think that, uh, you know, public programming, um, I know in some places in the world when there's like a public health challenge, they use like even billboards, right, to communicate to uh, large groups of people. So I, I feel like, using all the um, the avenues of communication to get this across would be very helpful. And I'm going to just add an ex another question related to this as well. You know, so I think a lot about, you know, that now that we are armed with this knowledge that potentially we can share this with our groups. Um, do you have any strategies for how to confront or talk to, you know, white parents in our circles um, who might have this colorblind ideology? Oh yeah, that's a great question too. Um, you know, in general, when I am engaging in a difficult conversation, um, I try to do as much listening, if not more listening than talking, right? And so um, I, I try to assume that parents are love their children and are trying to do what's best for their children, right? And so those decisions are often coming from a place of love. Right. And so when I'm talking to somebody um, about these issues, I might explain why I do what I do and why it's important to to understand the ways in which race talk maybe affects me or, or my child. Uh, and, and that's that's often been um, successful, right, in, in having these kinds of conversations. And I would also say that one conversation about really anything is not going to be the, like the be all end all, right, that you want to um, to do some listening, ask some questions about how, uh, you know, like, how do you talk about race at home? Um, and to have those conversations often with your adult friends as well. Uh, you know, parents need support. And, you know, as we can have, uh, you know, parent groups, you know, it would be nice if everybody was sort of part of a parent community, right, where we could share these experiences. And it would be even nicer if those groups were, um, were filled with diverse groups of parents, right? And so we're sharing um, our experiences. I know, you know, in over 20 years of teaching the psychology of prejudice, you know, these are beautifully diverse classrooms. Uh, and in students like Joy, have a space to be able to say out loud what it's like 
to grow up in a home where they have the talk. I don't know that Joy ever talked in a class about that anywhere else, right? So we don't have a lot of places where we devote time to to talking about race in the home. I know that uh, you know that's not something that comes up for me all that often, right? It's only when somebody asked me a question like that that I'm going to talk about um, maybe what it was like for me as a child. You know, when I when I presented the research about um, you know children internalizing low status. I think about me, right, little me, that despite actually having great models of ethnic identity and spending every weekend doing things related to cultural identity, uh, the messages that I was receiving at school uh, and, you know, sort of being exposed to racial slurs made me wish to not look like me. I didn't think I had beautiful brown skin then. For sure, no. And so that internalized low status shaped who I am. It shaped the way that I see the world. And I had to do a lot of unlearning uh, as I got older. And so, you know, we really want to uh, to communicate those things to people. So I know when I've shared that with adults uh, and other parents, that's, um, you know, people are like, oh, that's like, that's really sad. It, it totally is really sad, right? It's really sad that little me wanted to rip her skin off. Like, that's terrible. Uh, but it's not something that would come up in other contexts naturally. So I would say also, you know, uh, white allies, you know, have those conversations, share that story with someone um, and, and ask the types of questions when you have built a relationship with somebody else, right? So this is all based on having relationships that are kind of uh, long term. Thank you. Um, we have another question from the chat. Um, can you talk more about white racial socialization? How early should parents be talking about white privilege? Yes. Um, you know, you, uh, I, I would say if you're interested in this topic, that there's a lot of reading that you can do on it um, to, to learn about what it means to be white. And, and, and what we know is that uh, a, a lot of people who are white have, even if they're adults, have never spent a lot of time thinking about whiteness. Um, and, you know, many people of color have thought about sort of what their identity means to them. And, and certainly since um, this past summer, we've heard a lot of people talking about, um, you know, what it means to be white. I mean, I, I can't necessarily speak to this, um, but I can say that there are lots of resources out there to help you understand what that means and how to navigate that conversation with your children. I would say um, my advice is to, to, you know, to think about, uh, you know, I, I would say that, you know, topics like power and privilege, you may need to use different words uh, depending on how old the child is, right? And so think about that example from um, with the wagon, right? Uh, when we think about Renee, Renee is talking to Ling Mai about what white Americans are allowed to do, right? From Renee's perspective. And in that sense, Renee is talking about power and privilege without using words like power and privilege. So, you know, you could talk about and ask questions to your children as young as three years old, as young as four years old, uh, about what are, you know, what do you think, you know, people are allowed to do? Are all people allowed to do the, the same things? And, and that's a way to get at power and privilege without necessarily using those words. But, you know, as we can see from that study, uh, spontaneous race talk is happening with children that young. Thank you. I think that's important. And, you know, I it that question resonates with me. You know, we've done this work in, in my home and my son just this week said something like, mommy, I'm kind of glad I have white privilege. Um, and so recognizing that word and he's seven. Um, so I would love to get your insights. Um, how should you respond um, to something like that once it, your kids are doing this, starting to do this work and thinking about these topics? Yeah, what an interesting statement, right? Um, I mean, there's like so much packed into there, right? Like recognizing it exists, recognizing there's a benefit and maybe even thinking like, 
well, I'll take some of this benefit, right? I mean, uh, and that's, uh, that's not unusual for a seven-year-old to come to that conclusion. And so because you are an empathetic, uh, brilliant parent, uh, I am sure you responded really beautifully to that. I guess what I would say is, um, you know, sort of maybe think about like, well, who doesn't benefit from that? Like, what are the consequences of, of that kind of, of thinking? Um, and so just that empathy building, which I know you already do, um, but to really sort of um, exercise that muscle. We saw at the beginning of the presentation that when we spend all this time building these skills, that we have these great, you know, return on investments. And I feel like that that's like one of many conversations you're having about uh, like, you know, privilege and power and race talk. Uh, and I would say my my biggest take home message here is for this like continual talk, right? To keep at it. Like no one conversation is gonna be like, and now we're done and we tied a bow and it's over, right? That we're gonna do this often um, and to do it regularly. So let's try to get the numbers of the number of parents who are having these conversations to, to increase. And um, that means that there are more kids that have these tools to engage and, and thrive in a diverse world. That's my, my take home message, I hope. Thank you, and I really think that you've you've laid out that take home message beautifully for us and inspired us to continue to have you know these conversations with our kiddos. And if we haven't had them yet to start having those important conversations. So thank you so much for all of this wonderful information and for sharing with us today. We really appreciate it. Um, I do think in the time that we have remaining that Dr. Owen had a few words of closing. Okay, thank you, Shayla, and thank you so much, Selena Brody. Um, I appreciate it. Um, I we need to share with you all the many questions that were showing up that um, <laughs> would give us several more hours of good conversation, particularly um, focused on what do we do? What do we do with our kids? What do we do with our friends and our parents? How do we talk among ourselves? And um, I think there are many opportunities, and I think many more are opening up, which is just great. We've all seen that happening. Um, I'm very happy about that. So thank you, Selena, and thank you, Shayla, for your lovely introduction, and thanks to everyone who attended today. I do want to point out a couple of things. One is that we have posted, and you probably will see there, um, uh, an evaluation form. We really do love your feedback. We read it all, so please fill that out and send it to us. It will inform us about future lectures we might arrange for and um, more opportunities like this. Um, also, I do want to point out that the next lecture in our spring lecture series, in the Center for Children and Families spring lecture series, is featuring Dr. Kathy Tamas Lamanda, who is a professor of applied psychology from the Steinhardt School at NYU. Uh, Dr. Tamas Lamanda has probably published on just about everything, but she's in particular, in particular, she is a great expert on socialization practices related to optimal language development in children and um, its great consequences. So please come join us for that lecture. It is March 26th at 9.30, so another Friday morning at 9.30. And we're very, very pleased to be able to partner with the School of Behavioral and Brain Sciences Colloquium Series in presenting this lecture on that Friday morning. So thank you all for coming and um, have a great rest of the day, Friday, and a good weekend, and stay out of the rain. Take care, everybody.